Hey guys, how's it going? So Mills. <laughs> Some of you guys are funny, man. Anyways, it's a beautiful night out. Gonna have my customary cigar on nice nights. And we can talk dogs, we can talk dog training. Um, I'll tell you about some of the stuff that I've got going on here. Uh, if you guys have any questions um, relating to uh, training or anything else, you guys can feel free to ask. Let me just move this camera a little bit here. Evening, Melissa. How are you? seems to fundamentally bother some people that I smoke cigars. So I've decided that I'm going to have to smoke a few more than I normally do just for them. Australia in the house. We always have a few people from Australia. I see a bunch of you guys in from the uh, Power Obedience course. Michael, you're not on a monthly subscription if you're doing the Power Obedience modules. You're on a yearly subscription. How is Bang coming along? Bang is coming along fine. Um... I have a video that I'm going to be dropping on YouTube very shortly of her. Um, so you can kind of see where we're at in our training progression. Israel says, I have the best cigars. I'm going to send you one. Sweet, man. I'm never going to say no to cigars. Ty's dog vlogs. Hey, Haz, if you don't mind me asking, you still have Izzy. You mean Dizzy? No, Dizzy's with one of my employees now. He loved her. He wanted to live with her. So I said, by all means, have at her. How do you teach a dog to bark on command? Well, first you must have something that the dog wants. Food, a toy, bite equipment, something. And then you must frustrate the dog until the dog vocalizes and when the dog vocalizes you must reward the dog and uh, you rinse and repeat until uh, the dog understands that they must bark if they want that thing and then you could put a cue on it right but if you think like usually when people ask me this question they think they're gonna like train their dog to like do protection work or something like this if you're asking me this i guarantee you will not be able to train your dog to do protection work i've just seen so many people try and fail it's like it if it's your own dog and you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to be able to teach your dog to do it. So unfortunately, that's the case. You must go to professionals for this type of work. <laughs> North Pole, Alaska. What part of Alaska are you in? Alaska is huge, you know. Like, there's some really nice areas and then there's, like, polar areas <laughs> um i always wanted to ask what made you choose to breed prezas over other breeds other than the german shepherd it was early in my breeding career i decided to try breeding prezas anthony <coughs> and um you know i tried it for a couple years and realized it was not for me and they weren't for me i liked how they looked and, um, you know, I, I, I had met like a Pressa fairly early on that I thought was a really cool dog. You know, ironically, uh, found out that he had a cruciate ligament tear. And that's like kind of par for the course with the breed. They're either, you know, they weren't so either not so good for work or if they were good for work, they would always injure themselves because their body is not actually made to do that type of work that we do with the mouse and the shepherd. So, you know, Pressas were my learning experience on... The idea that you don't put square pegs in round holes. Cool. 
whatever happened with Louis the Bully. Louis the Bully is why I don't do um, anymore. And I, and I should have known better. I don't release befores and afters because my video guy isn't here all the time. And I don't release befores and afters until I've done the after usually just to make sure I actually get an after. And Louis was case in point. We trained the dog. We were supposed to get a video, you know, and then the, the video guy, you know, delayed a time or two. And then we were busy a time or two when he could do it. And we just, our, our schedules never lined up. And, um, yeah, my videographer never made a video of, of Louie in the end. And he went home and, uh, you know, he's at home and his family's very happy and so on and so forth. But unfortunately I just, you know, because he was, you know, he was done in three weeks. Right. And, and he was out the door and, and we just, our, our timelines didn't come together. And I unfortunately wasn't able to get an after of him. Have I had any health issues with the respiratory virus going around? No, I have not had any health issues with that. Now, there's like this really, just so that those of you who don't know, know, I'm hearing a lot. And, and uh, you know, my second in command, basically, Stephen, his wife is actually a uh, vet. Um, and, and she's confirmed it, that there's like this horrific kind of like respiratory virus going around. And... Um, it's killing like tons of dogs basically because you know, it, it presents as like a kennel cough symptom. So usually with kennel cough guys, if you don't know any, if you don't know kennel cough, usually like the common cold goes away on its own. You know, in, m in many cases they didn't even, they don't even treat it. If you take your dog to the vet for kennel cough, this particular strain seems to go directly to the dog's lungs and cause acute pneumonia very quickly. And if you don't treat with like really, really heavy antibiotics, um, apparently, uh, it's killing dogs very fast. Now I'm going to tell you guys something. So this is like big news now. Now, thankfully, thank God, there's no wood for me to knock on here, but thank God we have not had it and we have not seen it here. We're on high alert, trust me. And any, if I even hear like an inkling of a cough, we're going to go, you know, condition red, but we had this last year. Was it last year? Or was it the year before? It was, it was like maybe, maybe 18 months ago we had this. We saw this. It was like this crazy kennel cough. Like we have, you know, listen, if you run a dog kennel with kennel, with dogs coming in and out, you're going to see kennel cough, whether you like it or not. But we saw this 18 months ago and we would have dogs and all of a sudden they'd seem fine. And then boom, they just fall off a cliff and, you know, we would take them to the vet and all of a sudden they're on doxycycline, which by the way, is a very like heavy antibiotic. You know what I mean? Like. Um, and that was like the only way to get them better. And it was like a really rough experience we were having because it was super transmissible and it was super deadly if not properly treated quickly. Like if you waited on it with the wrong dog, it could kill the dog. So it was, it was one of those things where we went through this 18 months ago and I instituted, I'm going to tell you guys for free what we do because <laughs> I was consulting with vets. I was asking other people in the industry, I'm like, how can we avoid this? What do you do? What do you do? You know, it's like, we have literally, we're in the business of dogs coming in and dogs coming out. Dogs come in, we train them, they go out, and then a new dog comes and replaces the dog that we trained. And what we did was we finally, so I, I consulted with vets, this, that, and everything else, asking all these people, no one had any answers. So finally, what we decided to do kind of on our own, was we decided to copy the chicken farms. And what the chicken farms do is they have like a very, because I guess chickens, like these meat chickens, really catch diseases very easily. So they have very like strict policies. So so what chicken farms do is they have a crop that comes in, stays in. They don't allow any birds in or out, I guess. The, the crop grows up and then they get rid of the crop, right? The crop goes off to the uh, the processor and then they like vercon the entire barn, like fully disinfect the entire barn and then they bring in the new crop. So we've obviously, we, we, <laughs> we're not raising chickens, but it's the same concept. We will do cohorts of dogs. We do not mix cohorts. So we have a cohort system for the dogs in our care and 
we will only bring dogs in as, as long as that dog can be in and be out by the end of the cohort, right? And we don't mix our cohorts. So that way, even if, God forbid, a dog does get sick and passes it around, only that specific cohort will be affected. We're not going to keep passing it to the next dog and the next dog and the next dog. So that's our system, and it worked really well at clearing up all of it because the problem with this thing, like I said, we had it 18 months ago. It would not go away. It would not go away no matter what we did. It was just lingering and lingering. One dog, next dog, next dog, next dog. So finally, we just shut it all down, shut the whole business down into for, you know, like a few days, cleaned everything, restarted, and then instituted our cohort system, and it was it was great. It's changed everything, you know. So for sure, we make less money, obviously, because, you know, with the the typical way it works is like you have kennels, and you always keep your kennels full. One dog goes, another one comes in. But now we don't do it like that anymore. Our cohort begins. We take in dogs at the beginning, and we take in dogs throughout the cohort as long as their timeline for their training or boarding is over by the end of the cohort. And that's our rule. That's our system. For sure, it costs us more money to do it like that. But at the end of the day, healthier dogs. And uh, we've had very uh, next to no incidences of any kind of illness. And i um, very happy with that. So Michael asks me, can you do a video on Chico explaining why I think he's breed worthy? In particular, I want to know about his temperament, the character, as he sounds a lot more social than your other studs. So I revamped my breeding program, as you guys may or may not know. And in my new, so my last uh, stud dog was Onyx, right? For those of you who don't know, Gage's daddy. And Onyx was, he was a dog that had very, very high drive. He had really nice crushing grips. Um, but... Onyx was also very antisocial with anybody other than me. Like, if he didn't know you and you tried to touch him, you were going to literally lose your hand. Like, he wasn't a joke, you know. Like, Gage is antisocial, but Gage is, like, antisocial more in, like, a nervy way. Onyx was, like, confident antisocial. And he would hurt you, and he was quite capable of causing somebody severe injury if they didn't uh, watch their P's and Q's or if I wasn't controlling him. So... The problem was, I mean, I bred Onyx a lot. I used him a lot. We had some really nice puppies off of him. We had some social puppies. Um, the one thing with Onyx was he produced some smaller dogs, like like Gage, for instance. Like, I don't mind a few small dogs here or there. Like, you're always going to produce them. But too many small dogs, like, he was producing too many of them that were smaller, like Gage, and I don't, I don't like that. And then the other thing that he was doing was he would throw some nerves. So you have to understand most anti not most, pretty much all antisocial behavior, behavior stems from a nerve, right? Like the dog has a perception of you um, that is, you know, you're a potential threat, right? And that's why he is antisocial towards you. Now, the problem with that is if the dog has a very strong nervous system, he can handle that nerve. He can handle that, you know, suspicion of you in a productive way especially with good training if the dog is not does not have a strong nervous system right does not have any has anything less than a stellar nervous system then you see like a more nervy type of dog right and um my my belief now is that you know i noticed with onyx like some of the puppies like some of the puppies, I just didn't like, like, you know, the nerves on some of the puppies. Like Gage's point, case in point, he got all of Onyx. He didn't have all of Onyx's drive. He's about like 85% of Onyx's drive, but he doesn't quite have the nerves that Onyx has. So, you know, and, and you would see different versions of that repeated over and over again. And listen, part of breeding is being ruthless and like saying, okay, what's productive here? Like, is this good is this good for the breed? Is this good for, you know, my overall goals in terms of the type of dogs I want to produce, so on and so forth. And it's a ratios game. Like, what's the ratio you're producing? Are there, is there enough dogs that are being good? Like, it's, listen, I don't care who you're breeding with. You're going to produce some not good dogs. You're going to produce some dogs maybe you don't like. And then you're going to produce maybe some really good dogs. But at the end of the day, the ratios have to make sense. There has to be much more good. There must have to be much more upside than downside. And if they don't make sense, then you need to make some decisions. 
all this talking, my cigar's dying. Um, so anyways, long story short, I decided that I'm not going to use Onyx in breeding anymore. I'm not going to breed with those types of dogs generally anymore. I'm not saying never again, but I, I don't see that there's a huge, you know, need or demand for those types of dogs anymore. And I'll tell you why in a second here. So the reason why um, I decided, to, the reason why I really like Chico, and I wasn't sure if I was going to like him, right? Like I'm quite willing, especially for a male. Like if I buy a male and uh, he's less than what I would want uh, for breeding, I would not use him. Um, you know, we're in a state right now where there's a lot of, there's a few males around me that I would use for breeding. So I'm not like starving for stud dogs. It's funny because like, a year and a half, two years ago, there was like no stud dogs around that I would be willing to use even in this entire province. And now there's like four or five of them. So it's funny how things go. But uh, Chico came and, you know, I had heard like he was good and somebody I trusted had gone and checked him for me. And he told me he was like a really good dog. And this guy doesn't, that doesn't BS me about dogs ever. Um, so anyways, I bought, I took a risk. I bought the dog. I knew his health was good. That goes without saying, like he has a stamps on his hips and elbows, you know, um, he's a DM carrier, but he's not, obviously doesn't have DM. So that's something to take into account with the breeding, right? Like about like, I'd say half of German shepherds are DM carriers, but you never breed a carrier to a carrier. It's only carrier to clear. Onyx was a carrier as well. Um, incidentally, and Gage, I haven't even tested him because I have no plans on breeding him, but I would bet you he's probably a carrier too. So we knew he had the health certifications and his videos looked really good and all the things I'd heard about him looked really good. But he got here. And the first thing I noticed about him was super confident. Um, he, he was very outgoing. Uh, he was not worried about me at all. <laughs> he wasn't giving me the suspicious eyes or anything. He looked at me, but he didn't look at me like a puppy looks at you. you know, like <laughs> he didn't do that. He looked at me like, like a man looks at you. You know what I mean? Like he had that presence and I said, God damn, that's nice. Okay. I like that. I like a dog with presence. I don't like a dog that overreacts, you know, like, whoa, 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 none of that shit. I just like a dog's like, I'm here now. I'm here now. You know, like not worried, not like too goofy, like just, I am here, motherfuckers. I am here. You know, I like dogs like that. Um, and they're not so common, believe it or not, right? They're not so common. There's dogs that, you know, can be goofy or reactive or so on and so forth. But then you see them on the field and they look really good and people just tend to see them on the field. I like to see them in life. I like to see what they do in life, right? So I really like Chico's presence. That brought the ball out and whoo boy, he's dangerous with a ball. And by dangerous, I mean, he's so driven for the ball that if you aren't careful, you're going to get tagged. And a lot of people are like, yeah, I know my dog's like that too. And it's like, no, you don't know. <laughs> Most people are just really shitty at playing ball with their dogs. No offense guys. Um, but with Chico, like if you're not, if you weren't really careful in the beginning, you were going to lose a finger. Like he was like that for the ball. Like, like, you know, as my buddy Stefan says, you throw the ball on the ground, he's biting the ball and like, like half the grass is coming with that ball in his mouth, you know, like very intense for the ball. You know, I wouldn't drop that ball on cement, right? He'd break all his teeth trying to take the ball off the cement, right? So it's like intense, intense, extreme for the ball, which is excellent. That's what we want. We want that trait, extreme prey. And I started training with him, extreme drive for food, like, you know, hurts your hand taking the food from you. Not like, again, that bullshit puppy stuff that people allow where they're like, oh, he's so bitey. It's like, no, it's just nonsense puppy behavior. You know, this is a mature dog that is still showing this like level of intensity. And if you say, hey, knock it off, calm down, he doesn't lose his intensity. When you provide obstruction to the drive, you don't see the drive diminish. This is the big thing, right? Like a lot of people say, my dog's crazy, he's so high drive, he's so high prey, he's so high food drive. And then you start putting some pressure on the dog. Like, hey, you must not do that, right? Like you must not take the ball like that. You must not take the food like that. And then all of a sudden you see the dog, go, oh, okay, 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 sorry. Yeah, I'm not gonna do that. That's 99% of dogs and there's nothing wrong with that those are good end user dogs those are good dogs for police good dogs for sport good dogs for people you know to like keep there's nothing wrong with overly compliant dogs but they're not dogs for breeding 
right? Because a dog for breeding is a dog that is not compliant, especially when it comes to acquiring something he has drive for. Because if he is able easily to be put into a place of compliance, and I'm saying easily, right? To be put into a place of compliance that, to, that, that would prevent him from satisfying his drive, how much drive does he really have, right? How much hardness does he really have? And in many cases with all these dogs, with all these like stories, the second you get these dogs and you make control on them, you find it's a good dog maybe, but it's not like what they were saying. He was only appearing to be extreme because they were allowing him to just be wild and they never put any rules on him. When you can put rules on a dog and then you still see extreme, you know it's extreme. And that's one thing I found with Chico very quickly was this guy was like, it took... Uh, it took a fair bit of pressure to get him to the place where, you know, I was like, okay, now we're like more safe, you know, like he's not going to take my finger by accident. Not a mean dog, not a malicious dog. I don't actually have a problem with malicious dogs or mean dogs as long as they have a strong nervous system, but he wasn't any of those things. For, for me, it's a bonus, right? Obviously, it's nicer to uh, train with dogs like that. Um, he, uh, and then in the protection, man, like, you know, it took us a little bit to get him straight there. Like now he's like nicely under control in the protection by far not finished, but like he's, he's showing much more control in the protection. Um, and I like the, how much pressure he can take and he still like comes back all the time, like full power. This is the kind of dog for breeding. You know what I mean? He has nice grips. Uh, he has a beautiful body type, good health. We already talked about that. Extreme drive, super outgoing behavior um and dominant right he has the appropriate level of dominance right not like where it's like almost untenable but like if he's eating a bowl of food i'm not gonna try to take his food you know i'm pretty sure that might not end well um you know if he has a female and he's on her like <laughs> you know I bre i've been i bred him twice now we, we use a muzzle you know what i mean like it's one of these things right like he's he's a dog so that's my long answer to your short question Hope you're doing well. Can't wait to apply for a puppy when I finish college in two years. Have an encounter with a very creepy man in a store today. Really want to learn how to train protection. Get a good dog. Go to someone that knows what they're doing. Thanks for responding. Oh, sorry. So, guys, I'm sorry. I was talking too long. I'm behind. Hello with Jan live in England. Born in the Netherlands. Cool, man. I like the Netherlands. And I like England, too. Hey, Haz, I was wondering if you could tell me where I could get von der Staatsmacht hoodie. You have to email him, man. Like, I don't think he sells them. I think it's like he gave it to me when I came train with him, you know, like a few years ago. So you got to email Stefan or Stefan's people. And uh, if they sell them, then I'm sure they'll hook you up. Is there a difference when breeding for personal protection and sport? There's absolutely no difference, right? I might pick different dogs, but there's no difference, right? Because when you breed with the right dogs, you have the product for everything. So like sport dogs and police dogs are the same, all right? This may offend some people, but I don't give a shit. Sport dogs and police dogs are the same in terms of the quality we look for, right? Um, to be honest, with a sport dog, I'm going to be much more picky. If it's like a dog for me or for one of my friends where we're like, you know... It, things that you can see in a young adult, you know, where things that maybe the police would compromise on, we will not compromise on, right? But, you know, it's obviously we're competing, right? The police are not competing. Um, so what they're looking for, maybe they might look for less extreme things than what we would look for. But fundamentally, we want social, outgoing dogs, strong nervous systems, good grips, um, you know, high food drive, high prey drive, you know, all of these types of things, right? Good hunting drive, good hardness, so on and so forth. Um, you know, that spectrum can vary. The one thing with police dogs, obviously, is you want nice environmentals. I would never breed a dog that like had shitty environmentals anyways, because that will pass to the puppies. So it's a non sequitur. The only difference with a personal protection dog is the dog... I, I could I could have a dog that has less drive do personal protection. I could have a dog that maybe doesn't have the perfect genetic grip do personal protection um, because the requirements there, you know, it's not like I'm, you're not getting points in personal protection. But fundamentally, you would not say, oh, 
I'm going to breed shittier dogs because I want personal protection dogs. No, you would say, um, I'm going to breed, uh, I'm going to breed really strong, stable, outgoing dogs with really high drive. And I know I'm going to get plenty of puppies in the litters that I can select out as personal protection dogs. Right. Um, you know, as personal protection dogs, obviously I don't want any extreme drive. Um, that's not good. I mean, the majority of our clients do not want dog with extreme drive, but we do want good drive. The dog needs to have good drive. Um, because if they don't have good drive, you know, they're generally not so excited to do the work. And we do need dogs that are willing workers, even as personal protection dogs. Personal protection dogs, the most important thing is stability. We need a stable dog. And a lot of people confuse compliance with stability. That is not stability, right? If you, if you have like a very soft, compliant dog, that is weakness. That is not stability. Stability is a dog that is not overly impacted um, or reactive in social or environmental situations, right? So my, my, my personal protection dogs and dogs that we, we sell as personal protection dogs, they need to have a stable, courageous mindset, right? Obviously, again, there's a spectrum of that. Like for some people, certain things are more appropriate than for other people. But this idea that like you're making and breeding completely different dogs is, I've never seen it work out well right? Whenever people try to do that, it never works out well. They just end up with shit because fundamentally a good dog is a good dog. And yes, you'll have puppies in the litter that are more oriented to like police or sport and then others that are more oriented to personal protection. But like, you know, fundamentally they come from the same source. So I'll tell you guys right now, I bred, um, I bred Chico and Juice together because she came into heat. Um, and I mean, we don't know if that breeding is going to take, but we did breed them together. Um, and those dogs is an excellent example, like extreme drive on both sides, right? In both pedigrees, extreme drive. I guarantee you some of those puppies will be excellent personal protection dogs. And some of those puppies will be excellent police and, and sport dogs. You know what I mean? So it's like... That's an excellent example. Both social dogs, both, you know, dogs that have a lot of jam, dogs that, you know, have good hardness, dogs that have extreme, and I mean extreme, and I don't use that word lightly, prey drive, you know, and we're going to have some really beautiful puppies from that litter, um, and uh, we're going to have some scary puppies in that litter too, right? Just so much drive, right? But we'll also have some good, I guarantee you we'll have some good protection dogs. Chandra! Hey, buddy, we made it. Excellent, Chandra. Sorry, I'm way behind here. Interior of Alaska hasn't gotten cold yet. Well, good for you. You know, I heard this thing, you know, they're always going on about global warming, right? And like most things that is perpetuated in the media today, I just assume automatically if they're telling me it, it's bullshit. And that's not like me just being a conspiracy theorist. I, you know, hey, <laughs> trick me once. What's the, how's it go? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, right? Um, and anyways, the idea that, you know, the politicians would know like, hey, if you give us money, we'll fix, we'll fix the environment. It's like stupid stuff, right? But fundamentally, um, what I was hearing was that 200, the last 200 years has been the coldest in the last 10,000 years. So right now, what we're doing is we're comparing the current temperature to how it was over like the last, you know, 150 years and saying, well, we're, it's warming up. But when you compare us to the last 10,000 years, apparently, this is like we're coming back down more to the normal, right? Apparently, um, you know, it wasn't as cold as it has been for the last 200 years, for the last 10,000 years, if that makes sense to anybody. It makes sense to me, but I understand that I might not be putting it out there. So, um, you know, they say global warming, maybe we're just coming back to a, a more normal temperature and listen, uh, no word of a lie. I mean, you can definitely see like w things are warmer, longer, you get more life, more, more, uh, plant life, more animal life, so on and so forth. So I'm not going to complain. I get to smoke my cigars longer too. Let's see what else we got here. Do you think that flat collars will eventually be banned because of the force-free lobby? I wouldn't be surprised given the pressure they put on the trachea. You know what's interesting? People are like so crazy about like the trachea. You know, I posted that video of um, that Malwa juice that I had 
and she's like being crazy at the vet. I just got the dog like a few days before we ended up at the vet for the um, insemination. And um, <laughs> the she's like, like, you know, pulling on the, on the leash as they all do. And she's wearing a flat, like a uh, inch and a half collar, inch and a half wide collar. Her trachea is going to collapse. Her trachea is going to collapse. And it, I'm like, man, what people think dogs are made of glass. You know, I do all my protection work on agit on thick collars, right? And thin collars. I do all my protection work on collars. I don't generally use ever harnesses. And that's for protection where the dog is supposed to be pulling, pulling, pulling. I have dogs pulling maximum uh, you know, full power into that into that leash as hard as they can, hammering into the end of it. Right? And typically, of course, I'm using an agitation collar that's like two inches to one and a half inches wide. But Everyone seems to think dogs these days are made of glass. Now, I don't doubt that, you know, at some point, you know, there's been some dog that maybe had like a genetically weak neck or something and they ran like some bulldog or something, ran into the end of the leash and broke their own trachea and killed themselves. I know for a fact it's happened, right? It's never happened to me, thank God, and I've never seen it. But I don't, I don't act like I don't, you know, uh, comport myself but with the exception, you know, like I ch I'll choke a dog off, off a sleeve. I'll choke a dog off balls. I've been doing it for years and years and years, right? It's, it's a frustration building exercise that we do with a lot of the protection dogs and, and the puppies to build more drive and frustration, so on and so forth. Um, you know, so this idea that dogs have like tracheas that are made out of glass, I'm like, from where, you know, like <laughs> I have no, no doubt that some doodle somewhere does have a weak trachea, but we're not talking about doodles here. We're talking about working dogs, you know? So yeah, this, people are funny. Do I have an opinion on the XL bully ban in the UK? An opinion to motion, uh, the, the motion, there's a motion to ban nano bully breeding in the USA. Well, nano bullies are, Assuming you're talking about like these like exotics, if it's the exotics, the exotics are, listen, I'm not, the government never makes anything better. So I'm not for any kind of government legislation, even though I, in my opinion, these people are reproducing Quasimodo daily. If you're talking about those exotic dogs with the turned out elbows and they're just a genetic mess. I think it's unethical to breed those dogs. You know, I think it's a terrible thing, but I don't think that the government has ever made anything better ever when it comes to rules like that right um and the same with dog bands it's like i i have no doubt that someone somewhere let their xl bully get out of control and it probably hurt somebody but you can apply that to a lot of different breeds you know the uk is one of these places that has run amok with the nanny state right they're very comfortable with the nanny state over there you know enough of their citizens are comfortable with the nanny state that the nanny state keeps doing more and more things whether they're putting people in jail for facebook posts that they don't like or 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 confiscating people's dogs because they're the wrong breed right i have no doubt in the uk at some point malinois and german shepherds and bite work and everything will be banned just like you know what's going to happen in europe at some point in most places in western europe it's, it is what it is. Do I think it's a good thing? No. Do I think most XL bullies are like dangerous dogs? No. You know, I think the UK has done their very best to ban effective training and or demonize it. And then now they're wondering why they have all these, you know, and then the, and now they're going to the next step, which is to ban the dogs that maybe, uh, you know, are, are intimidating. And then the dogs that aren't so easily trained, you know, I've literally seen you know, the force-free lobby say dogs with thin thresholds and high drive should not be bred, right? Not that that applies to the XL bullies. Most of them are big, chunky, lazy dogs. You know what I mean? So it's just one of those. It's just another thing, you know. Nannies, the nanny state is never good. The nanny state is never good. They never make anything better. No matter how good it sounds, it never turns out well. Oh, you know, I hate puppy mills. I want the government. no. I don't want the government involved in, in, in the breeding of dogs because who decides what's a puppy mill? Oh, it's if you have 500 dogs in a barn. Yeah, that's me and you talking now. But some crazy bureaucrat gets together with some dog charity, you know, that's that's lobbying them. And now all of a sudden a puppy mill is somebody who's breeding, you know, uh, 10 dogs out of their, you know, house or something like this. It's like be careful, just like terrorists, right? Terrorists were those brown people overseas, you know, Muhammad ibn al Said was a terrorist. And now Joe Blow in the mountains of Appalachia, who said some things about the ATF that people don't like, or, you know, the, the, the trucker, whatever that chick was, um, out in BC, she's out West. What's her name? 
They put her in jail in Canada for organizing the trucker protest. They like treated her worse than like a sex offender gets treated. Like a sex offender here, you know, God forbid you grape a child or something, right? Like you get like less than two years here for that kind of nonsense. Whereas, you know, this poor lady that like was just protesting for freedom, whether you agree with her or not, she was protesting. She was within her rights to organize a protest, has her bank accounts locked. She's put in jail for years. The government never makes anything better. That's fundamentally it. Hey, Haz, how do you stop off-leash dogs on e-collar to not go too far ahead of me on their walks when I break them? Just call them every time they go far. He gets to that red line in your head, wherever that is, right? 50 feet, 60 feet. Just say his name. Call him. Never let him get past the line. He'll figure it out quickly. I have a question about redirected frustration on me. My German Shepherd bit me. When I tried to pull her away from the dog fence where she was barking at another dog. Yeah, you must punish this behavior. Redirection is an unconscious behavior, but you can make the dog conscious of it very quick with the correct application of punishment for that behavior. Right? So it's not generally a malicious behavior where the dog like says, if you do this, I'm going to do that. It's more of an unconscious behavior. But I can make the dog conscious of it if I apply a significant aversive consequence to that act. Right? You redirect on me, God have mercy on your soul. You know what I mean? And and now the dogs learn real, okay, you know, I have to be very cognizant. Even if I'm super active, I am not allowed to turn around and bite that guy. I have a Malwa and she is a maniac. Very sensitive though. Yep, that's typical. Hey, what's up? Love your work. And you wish I could come train with you, but I'm in Los Angeles. It was cool to hear your thoughts on the cop abusing his canine. He's referring to that video I did on the Riverside County thing. Yeah, it's another example, you know, like society is not in a good place right now. Inshallah, it gets better soon. I love the newest Patreon and YouTube video of the protection work. Keep them coming. Absolutely, Tyler. I like Patreon, man. You know, like, there's some apps that, like, you start using and you're like, man, I like this. I like, I can post anything on there. You know what I mean? Like, I could just post it. It's great. I like Patreon. I'm going to be posting a lot on there in the years to come. Hey, has got the secret sauce. Very informative. Thank you. How's Kevin? Kevin's very good. Kevin's at his new home. I'm going to drop a reel on Patreon just so people can see, uh, you know, uh, where he ended up. He has, I have a Malwa, three years old. He has protection. The only problem is inside the kennel or the truck. The crying is continuously every time. How can I stop him from doing that? You must correct him when he makes noise, you know? Like, there's a lot of dogs that are so vocal in the crate or in the truck or in the box or in the kennel. You must, I don't like noisy dogs that are pointlessly noisy. I don't think it's good for them, right? Because when they practice that anxious, high-strung, you know, reactive, whatever it is, behavior, it's not a good mental state for them to be in. So when you stop allowing them to practice it, believe it or not, they stop feeling like that. For me, my dogs should sleep in the crate. They should be quiet in the crate. They can watch calmly or quietly, but they must not be, ah, ah, none of that crap. You do that, I'm going to correct you. Don't do it. Brad from Louisiana, I bought your book and I'm learning a lot. Great book. Awesome, Brad. Glad you like it. I work at a vet. We had one dog with it so far and they wanted to board a dog at a doggy daycare while they went on vacation. Yep, it's going around. I hope we don't see it here, but if we do, we're ready. You know, we'll do what we need to do. Has been a longtime fan. Have you heard the bloodline Teaker Hook? And if so, what's your thoughts? Teaker Hook's like an old bloodline. I've seen some of the dogs, you know, like some of the dogs were okay. It's one of those do those bloodlines, I think, has like a lot of hype. Um, I think they kind of, in my opinion, look, I could be wrong. Like I, I heard that the founder, I saw on Facebook, the founder died recently or something and he sold his dogs or, or his family sold the dogs or whatever. But like, for me, like the dogs were a little bit too hyped. Like I never saw anything from Teaker Hook. I was like, wow, I need to have it. It's kind of like DDR, you know, like check. 
everybody's like, oh, I have to have it. It's like, you know, and then you get it and it's like, hmm, you know, like I've never really seen like a Tiger Hook dog that really was like, wow, you know, like this dog is like something special. Um, you know, I've seen Waller horse dogs that are like that. I've seen a few other breeders, you know, producing super nice dogs, but like, I think Tiger Hook fell off a while ago in my opinion, but that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. We'll see. I think people have their dogs and they're going to use their dogs and we'll see. But again, you know, you must have the right combinations. More vids of juice, please. Oh, there will be. Don't worry. Hey, I have a question. I have an eight-month-old Pressa and he's getting very aggressive. What should I do? He's going to be very big. <laughs> yeah, you better get control of your dog, my friend. Like, there's nothing like, what do you want me to tell you? You got to get control of your dog. That's it. Like, you have to have full functional control of your dog. Your dog has to understand what no means. Your dog has to be under control, properly managed, so on and so forth. How's Mace? Mace is good as far as I know. No problems yet. Do you think they'll stop imports for a while if the virus continues? No, because the virus is already here. Stopping imports isn't going to impact it because... You know, if it did, if it did, and I told you already, I've seen it 18 months ago. So I can't, I'm not even going to say it like came from like overseas, right? I, I think it's here. I think it's a extension of kennel cough, just like we get nasty strains of the flu or, or the common cold. And, um, you know, it'll burn itself out as all these things do. My younger brother and I look up to you a lot. Oof. Can you tell us about the beginning of your dog training career? How did you manage your business when working another job? How was it working with your bro? I'll tell you this, Anthony. Your brother is God's gift of a business partner to you. As long as you guys are like on the same page, you know, like as long as you guys both want, you know, what's best for each other, as long as you guys both have like that drive and that ambition to be successful. I mean, if you can't trust somebody who, like if you can't trust your brother, who can you trust? You know what I mean? So like, um, and that's why I'm so happy I have two sons, you know, cause I hope that when they grow up, they'll do business together as well. And, and they'll rely on each other. Cause you know, um, it, a lot of business partnerships are like, you know, he's bringing something, I'm bringing something and there's nothing wrong with that, but two brothers, you guys can start with nothing and you'll, you, you can have the patience to work with each other to, to get where you want to go. Uh, how did I start my dog training journey? I had a passion for it. I was very interested in it. I was very excited about it. I spent every spare minute and hour I had studying it, watching it, immersed myself in it, learned everything I could about it, read about it, you know, tried things with my own dogs. And just over the years, slowly, slowly, slowly developed, developed, developed until next thing you know, I'm training dogs part time. It was never my intention to become a professional dog trainer. I was just legitimately interested in it. It was it was a passion that that took me over. You know, I was interested in dog behavior. I was interested in dog sport. I was interested in everything about it. And uh, you know, I never took no for an answer. That's the other thing. You know, like when I got into it, there was a lot of people that told me no. There was a lot of people that told gave me bullshit, g led me on false paths. You know, like gave me bad information, were rude to me, were diminished me, uh, you know, talked down to me, so on and so forth, right? Said things about me, you know, all sorts of things, dog clubs everywhere, right? I went through a lot of shit, but because I had a legitimate passion for it and I was legitimately interested in it and I'm legitimately, you know, like, I, I am in love with the, the craft of dog training. I Like, if I go on vacation... After like three days, I start getting the itch to train dogs. You know what I mean? Like, it's like that for me. And thank God I fell into it because, you know, I really enjoy it. I enjoy going to work um, every day. So, you know, it's one of those things where it's like uh, you have to have a passion for it, you know. And then if you have a passion for it, you're going to be motivated to do all the things you need to do to get good at it. And you're going to spend the necessary thousands of hours on the end of the leash dealing with the different dogs and problem solving your way through all the behavioral stuff and all the obedience stuff and seeing what works and what doesn't work. You also have strong discernibility, right? Don't ever like you can say, hey, like that guy's good. OK, but don't worship anybody. Don't worship me. Don't worship anybody. I don't care who the fuck they are. Don't worship anybody. Everybody is fallible. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody does things wrong. Everybody could do something better. There's too many people in this industry that go and like worship somebody. Like, oh, this guy is like the God. Like there is no God. And I never, like, there's no God but God. 
right? No, don't get me wrong. But like, I never was like that. And that also caused me problems too. Cause like I never went and like sucked up to anybody, you know, I was respectful to people, but I never sucked up to anybody. And I always had my own opinion. Um, but it's very important, you know, like you have to look at things objectively. You have to look at the results. You have to try things for yourself and see what the results that come from it. Believe it or not, I tried some force-free ideologies, right? Like I try, I try clicker training just by itself. I tried, um, you know, behavior adjustment therapy. Uh, I tried bat, cat, all these things, right? Like before I say something doesn't work and many times like in the beginning, I would try different shit with my dogs to see what worked and didn't work. I was also blessed by God in many ways. And one of the ways that he blessed me was in the beginning, he gave me a lot of dogs that were horrific dogs. <laughs> like to this day, I'm like, holy crap. Like, like, how did I end up with like, like I had like this female shepherd. She was like so reactive. Like this was like maybe my second dog, right? Like the first dog um, that I owned, like was my own personal dog. I got from the Humane Society. Like she was a nice long coat German shepherd, social, easygoing, like the best first dog. But then after that, I said, okay, I want to get into this working stuff. So I go on Kijiji like a retard, you know, and I see like, oh, okay, there's this guy selling. So I go and I buy like this half show line, half check line, you know, female German shepherd. And she was just a reactive POS, just a terrible, terrible dog. And I, I made that dog full off leash trained. I controlled the reactivity, you know, but like she was so bad. Like to this day, she was like, her level of reactivity was like worse than like many, many of the reactive dogs that I still see today. I still like wonder, I'm like, wow. Like, thank God I had that dog so early. I had to figure it out because I always had something in my mind. Like, how do I want to live with my dogs? Right? Like in, in the beginning for me, sport wasn't so big. Like I wasn't that interested in sport for me. The big thing was like, I didn't like my kids weren't living with me or anything. So like I have two older kids and then I have two younger kids. My two younger kids didn't exist. And my older kids weren't living with me. So I had a lot of spare, you know, spare time. I like to go hiking a lot. We went camping a lot, so on and so forth. And I like my dogs always to be with me, but I never liked to use the leash or anything like that. So I needed a fully off leash trained dog. I wanted to take my dog everywhere with me in the truck, um, on the hikes, in the city, wherever I was, I wanted my dog next to me and good. And I was not given dogs that it was easy to do that with in the beginning. So I learned how to make that level of control with a lot of different types of dogs. And then I always just created that for my clients. I said, well, I liked it. They're going to like it. And that's what I offer my clients, that off-leash freedom, so on and so forth. And then the behavioral control for me was, it was very intuitive, right? Like a lot of people look at behavior like the wrong way. They're like, you know, like I hope my dog doesn't do X. For me, it's like, I look at behavior like my dog will not do X. If my dog, it's not possible. It's not possible to be around me and to act like that. You know what I mean? Like, not for my kids, not for my dogs, nothing. Like, I have that mentality. And that, that bleeds into the dog and that bleeds into the child, believe it or not, right? Like, they're like, okay, I just can't act like that around this guy. Like, it's just not possible. Like, the consequences are significant enough that I will not do this around him, right? And then I saw how that changed their behavior. And then, of course, you must look at different ways to make that happen for other people that aren't you, right? And so on and so forth. It's just lots and lots of time and being introspective and what what could i do better and you know it's 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 a it's a journey it's a it's a marathon it's not a sprint by the way for those of you now it's time for me to plug something for those of you interested in becoming a professional dog trainer my online uh, dog trainer course is now live not only do we teach you how to train dogs we teach you how to run a successful dog training business check it out uh, email us info at shieldk9.ca we're going to be doing a january intake um, I already have my December cohort running. Um, we already have our first crop of shield certified pro trainers in the course. I'm going to, I'm, we're going to show you how to do it. And then we're going to certify you as long as you pass our tests. Um, and it's all remote by the way, it's all remote. So anyways, guys, that's a long, again, another long answer. Hey guys, I see you all on here. I'm selling hurricane instead of breeding her. No, I'm breeding her, but then I'm going to sell her. Hurricane is going to produce excellent personal protection dogs and probably some nice sport dogs. The, the so Hurricane, the one thing with Hurricane I would say is like, I like her temperament. Like she has like a nice 
temperament. She has like a, a very good classic German shepherd temperament. You know, an appropriate level of suspicion of strangers, but like generally social and open. She has a beautiful um, physical appearance. Um, you know, she has a long coat. Uh, the SV has a rule now that like if you want to compete at the world level championships, the dog cannot be from long coats or a long coat. It's a stupid rule. Probably they will repeal it, but right now that's the rule. So, you know, from a sport dog perspective, I don't think that she'll produce uh, that I'll be able to really use those dogs so much for sport. But I have so many people that want a nice family companion or personal protection dog, um, and I'm sure she'll make some police dogs. So I bred her to Chico today, actually. Um, so that breeding is going to go. And then after uh, she has her litter, we'll, uh, we'll sell her as a uh, family protection dog because I think that's going to be the right spot for her. And by then, I'll have some other females in that I was – going to use as well i don't like to keep too many females at the same time um hey need advice what's the best start with 77 year old woman with an unruly one year old russell and a seven month frenchie yeah i mean you got to start with some loose leash walking you got to start with some house management you know it's always difficult when you're dealing with people with physical limitations and then they have young active dogs you know in some cases you can make it work in other cases maybe not so much you know what's the rough price for a puppy from Staatsmarkt? you got to talk to him i'm going to tell you this though don't go to stefan with anything less don't don't act like a problem don't ask him too many like silly questions or stuff like this because he just won't respond i promise you that right so like if you're if you're serious about a puppy from him give him like short and sweet what you're looking for ask him politely if he can help you and if he decides to sell you a puppy good uh what advice would you give for some aversion to traffic loud vehicle noise is it just repeated socialization around it well, it depends what you mean by socialization. Um, with dogs that are nervous about things, I teach them to function in spite of their nervousness of that thing. I don't say, hey, look, the car is your friend, because that never actually works, right? Let's see. Another redirection question, I already asked, I already answered it. So I'm not going to answer it again. You can go back and watch. But I already answered several times, like, how to deal with redirection from dogs. Would you or do you rate other popular YouTube dog trainers? Like, are there other online trainers that you say, this guy's good, that guy, eh, that guy. <laughs> I'll say this about YouTube dog trainers. You can look at the results and see for yourself. And if there are no results or it's hard to find the results then you must ask yourself, what's going on here? You know what I mean? Um, I, I think, to be honest, the vast majority of YouTube dog trainers are mid at best. And that's me being straight up. Uh, mid at best, but, you know, good at making content, right? Uh, that's, that's, that's the reality of it. And then, of course, there's always a few good ones. There's always a few good ones, you know? And again, it depends. What are we talking about? Good at what? right? Because some people are very specified to certain things. So I did a uh, live, I did a live uh, training on my Instagram, right? Like I just took three of the dogs I'm training. I went live on Instagram and I just trained them, you know, for like an hour in front of everybody, you know, I think if you're a dog trainer, you should be able to do something like that and not worry, you know, not worry like oh no like they're gonna make me look bad because they're not gonna do everything i want them to do or something like this like if your training is good and you're good at what you do people will see it and you don't need to like put every video through a thousand edits you know what i mean like i only edit my videos a lot like if you go back to my old videos there's a lot less editing my current videos there are certain things i'll edit just because like i said i have to be respectful of the people that paid for my online training those people that paid for my online training i'm not gonna go and give away all that information for free now on youtube right yeah chico and swamp aren't going to happen because they're both dm carriers 
So Chico and Swamp aren't going to happen, unfortunately. I actually think like their their character traits actually would really go well together. Uh, Swamp, I have another male in mind for, but he's like basically another version of Chico. My buddy Jack owns him, um, and uh, I think his name is Ike. Super nice dog, super nice pedigree, like very similar behavior to Chico. It's kind of funny, you know, like very same same type of behavior, right? So I, I, I have no doubt they'll produce well. How do you recommend helping a fear reactive dog that's very nervous around humans, but once he gets around them a while, he likes them? Um, you're never going to make him just like everybody he runs into, right? Every dog that's nervous around people, once he gets around people, you know, for a certain period of time. For some dogs, it's a, it's a few minutes. For some dogs, it's a few hours. And for other dogs, it's a few weeks, you know. But at some point, they're going to warm up to the people that they're habituated to, you know. That's not the problem. The problem is the initial reaction, and you will never change that. What you're going to do is you, you teach that dog to function in spite of that fear, and you manage that dog appropriately. So it's like, look, if I know my dog is nervous, um, is, is made nervous by strangers interacting with him, I'm not going to allow strangers to interact with him. And this is very possible. People act like this is like some kind of an impossible thing to achieve or accomplish. I just go out with my dog. Someone say, hey, that's an awesome dog. Thanks, man. Can I touch him? No? Okay. There you go. Problem solved, right? Like the dog's like off leash next to me, you know, behaving himself. It's like, just don't touch him. And like, I'm not going to walk him through like a kindergarten class or something because that wouldn't be fair to the kindergartners and it wouldn't be fair to him. But like, I can walk him in 99% of public places without like needing a leash. I take my antisocial dog to the airport. I flew him last year. You know what I mean? Like he was off leash in the airport with me. Like, it's not a problem. But I don't put him in positions where, you know, someone's going to touch him. And like, you know, like try and like pet him or interact with him because I know that would make him upset, right? So why would I do that? And the more your dog trusts that you're not going to put them in that position and that circumstance and that situation, the less reactive and worried he's going to be. It's like, yeah, there's people everywhere, but they're not going to hurt me. They're not going to bother me. They're not going to do anything to me. So I don't need to worry about them. But when you keep trying to make always this interaction, you make them more nervous, not less nervous. Do I still have Vasco? I never had Vasco. He's uh, he's with, with Carson. He's with Carson. He lives with Carson, my buddy Carson. Um, you know, he was just training with me all the time with the dog, right? Um, but he, he lives with my buddy Carson. Would I breed him again? I might. I might. You know, he goes with a very specific kind of female. Like, you don't just, like, put Vasco to anything, you know? Like, you have to be very careful with a dog like Vasco. He can bring something to the breeding and, like, Pamela, I believe you're somebody that has a Vasco puppy. So you guys all know how that turned out. Super social, stable dogs. And my buddy Joel has a really nice black dog from Vasco too that we're training right now. Really nice dog. Um, doesn't have any of Vasco's faults and has some of his qualities, you know. Um, but in terms of like just breeding him willy-nilly, no, you have to be careful. There's some studs that go with a lot of things and there's some studs that go with like a very few th select things and Vasco's like one of them. I have a male out of Ramos von Kapkar Katago and I wanted to know where I can get a Stotzmacht hoodie. <laughs> Everybody wants that Stotzmacht hoodie, man. Nobody wants the Shield Canine hoodie. Come on, guys. I sell that on my website. You got you to gotta hit up Stefan. You got to hit up Stefan. Maybe he'll sell it to you. I don't know if he still makes them. Would I correct a dog that is redirecting on me because I'm creating frustration with a toy and he can't get it? For sure. There's never a good reason to redirect on me. Gotta have dogs like Chico otherwise end up breeding out the intensity in the long run. For sure. How many gigs of info on dogs do you have in your brain? I don't know. A lot. <laughs> I've been filling my brain for the last probably 15 years with info on dogs so is power obedience the same as the elite gold package no elite gold package is everything power obedience is uh our, our competition obedience uh, courses uh what else we got here why do dogs lick their lips is it a sign of stress i see so many positive only trainers talking about it it can be a sign of stress but it's also a sign of concentration too right so, like, stress and concentration are like this, right? So, if, like, 
For instance, you don't believe me, watch a border collie herding sheep. The prey drive becomes so intense. The dog goes into this laser-focused concentration. He's creeping, his body is stiff, his head is down, his tail is down. Sometimes the tail is slightly tucked. Ears are back. And they're doing this, right? Concentration and stress. I mean, you could say that Stress causes concentration, right? Like he's so stressed, he's so, his drive is so extreme for the task and he doesn't want to make a mistake, right? Have you ever done that? Like something where you're like, okay, I really can't fuck this up. Like I have to pay so close attention to what I'm doing here. Like maybe like you're doing like a really challenge. Like if you're driving like 120 kilometers per hour during like a snowstorm, I've done it so I can talk about this. Or you're driving like a snowmobile really fast down like some windy trails, right? Like, and it's like, one mistake and you could die, right? And like that creates stress. You're also highly motivated to do it, right? Because you're stupid and you like the adrenaline dump you're getting from it. But like you're also stressed and you're concentrating, right? And it's like all together, you know? Positive only people love to use any like small, tiny, isolated piece of body language they can to like, that's because they're afraid of stress. They don't like stress. Stress is bad. All stress is bad. No, it's not. Stress is an essential ingredient to growth. I did a YouTube video on this very recently. You need stress as a part of any kind of training or learning process in order to make it fully reliable and to get the most out of it. There's good stress and there's bad stress. For positive only trainers, all stress is bad stress. And of course, that completely limits their ability to actually create mental and physical resilience in their dogs or in themselves. Usually, they're also very fragile people, even though they don't hesitate to you know, use stress to try and force other people to agree with their ideologies. Have you worked with wolves? Why not work with them more? Because wolves don't pay well. <laughs> and I don't really have very much interest. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I want to do protection work with my Prezo. What age should I start? He comes from Romania and has good parents. Serber from Carpatcan and his mother is from Spain. I mean, you know, you can start early. Like if you want to just do puppy rag work, you know, if he has some drive for the rag, you can do it like three, two, three months old. You know, you can get started. Does my Ottawa location offer bite work training? Training. If so, can you tell us about the decoy over there? Uh, I think they do some of it. Uh, it's a couple of ladies over there. So girl power. Um, you guys can hit them up and see what they do. They do PSA, like so. the 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 girl that uh, is the head trainer over there, Shelby, she does PSA. So, um, you know, if you guys want something related to that, she can help you. Do I have a conditioning program for my sport dogs? I always warm them up before I do anything crazy, but I don't have a conditioning because. When you train enough to prepare them for a trial, generally speaking, they're in great condition. Like if you look at um, like Gage when he's like in trial, like if you look at his trial videos, you see like the muscles moving on his shoulders. You see he's like really lean, like like but not too lean. You know what I mean? Like like he's in great physical condition. He's not getting excessively tired or anything like that. That's because all the training we did leading up put him in shape. You know, like we're training three phases a day. I don't need to do extra to, to condition him. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, like, I don't really do anything. Like, I know some people, they put their dogs on the slap mill and all that stuff. Roberto Russo, pinning a dog. Have you had the need to use this technique? If so, what point in the training do you use that technique? I've experimented with it. It doesn't really work. It doesn't work. Um, you're basically restraining a dog. And when you restrain the dog, it doesn't really work, you know? Um, I don't restrain. If I have an undesirable behavior, I punish it. <laughs> I saw on Kijiji a Malwa X Dutch has, you should buy one and raise it into a police canine. You're kidding me, right, Maddie? I hope you're kidding with me. I'm glad to hear that Gage is not overly social. I feel like I have an obligation to make my dogs like my family and friends. No, you don't. <laughs> can whining be corrected or is it strictly the temperament of the dog? Well, it's both, but for sure you can correct it. 
Absolutely. I correct whining. I would never live with a dog that whines all the time. That is like Chinese water torture. I would never put up with it. Has be careful talking about sport versus PPD. Hans Alpine will pop in the chat talking about his DDR bite the weapon hand BS. <laughs> oh, man. It's good to know some of these old guys are still doing it, you know, like... <laughs> And there's still people buying it. Uh, I heard they're currently trying to ban dog protection sports in Austria. Yeah, for sure. Like I said, they're going to ban everything in Western Europe, right? Maybe in Canada. Who knows? This is the world we live in, guys. Like, what input would I have? You know, it's like everybody's okay with the government banning stuff they don't like until it starts to be something they like. Like, yeah. The government should ban hate speech and they should ban puppy mills, but not dog sport. I like the dog sport. Oh, yeah, the government should ban IGP, but not agility. I love agility. It's like, you idiots, don't you ever learn? The government never is good. It's never, ever good to ban anything. The, 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 the good created by the van is far outweighed by all the harm that ban will do. A absolute power corrupts absolutely. And you never want other people in charge of your life, you know, just because maybe you get some some temporary satisfaction from watching the guy you don't like getting shut down, you know, even if he's a bad guy legitimately. So, no, bad government. How is Chico and Juice's defensive drive? I mean, you're talking about reactive aggression that originates in fear and insecurity. I haven't seen it because I've never seen either dog afraid or insecure. <laughs> but judging by their nervous systems, I'm sure they'll come to the challenge. You know what I mean? Like, they're not reactive dogs. Reactive dogs are dogs that's like, I'm worried, so I'm going to become active and aroused. Like, Gage is more like that. And, you know, we call this defense. But it's not like, and people like mistake, like, look, for a protection dog, like as a as a personal protection dog, I don't mind if a dog has, you know, a fair bit of defense, depending again on the situation the dog is going into. But like generally from a breeding perspective, it's not something where I'm like, oh, yeah, we need more of that because that's just nerve, right? That's just nerve. That's all that is. Um, let's see what else we got. When breeding, are you looking to have more defensive or prey driven dogs? I'm always looking for prey. Prey is everything. Prey and a strong nervous system. Is juice the male you can't train? That's right, Greg. <laughs> Greg's a funny guy. I can't train her. I don't know what I'll ever do. Can't train the cute little female male with the crazy drive. Maybe somebody will help me one day. Uh, how do I know if a correction is fair based on the dog in front of you? Um, no, it, it just has to make sense. Right? Like this idea of a fair correction. Like she will, what is it? I bought a dog recently. The owner tells, tells me, it's like, she will come up the leash over an unfair correction. I'm like, wow, your dog's like, that's smart. Like she's like, no, that was fair. So that's okay. But that's unfair. Usually what that means in the best scenario is that if the dog understands why the pressure is being applied, the dog will become correct instead of coming up the leash. If the dog is insecure or doesn't understand why that specific instance of pressure occurred, the dog will come up the leash, right? Um, there's no such thing as a fair or unfair correction. Now, there's bad and not good training, but fundamentally, the dog must accept the pressure. And if you're training in such a way that the dog doesn't accept the pressure, you must ask yourself, how are you training, right? A lot of people are stupid, right? So, like, they'll watch me train my dog. And, like, I use a lot of electric with my dog. And they don't understand why I'm using electric. So they assume mistakenly that I'm using electric with my dog to gain compliance. And it's like, bro, that's like such a small part of the picture of why I'm using that. Like you don't understand all the things I did to him as a puppy in the training process so that he would perceive the electric pe pressure I'm applying to him in a certain way. And it's creating the result that you see. If you do this to your dog, your dog's going to be a quivering mess on the ground. And maybe your dog is like actually a better dog than my dog, but he's still going to end up that way because you didn't build him properly to the pressure, right? You didn't build him properly to the pressure. My dog has been built to the pressure. I made him more physically and mentally resilient to the pressure, but I also taught him productive responses to the pressure. He knows how to come out of the pressure. The pressure creates an emotional response in him that is productive, not unproductive. It doesn't suppress him. It activates him. It makes more. It doesn't make less. It's gas. 
right? It's gas, but you have to know how to make the gas. If you don't make the gas and you just make pressure, bad shit's going to happen. Just wanted to pop in and say thanks for the live chats. You keep it real, and we appreciate vastly the sharing your passion, knowledge, and advice. Appreciate you, buddy. I'm glad you like the real shit. You know, sometimes <laughs> some people, they really don't like it. You know, like they don't like the way I talk. They don't like the things I say. And, um, you know, I think they're frag there's a lot of fragile people in this world, and there's a lot of people that are bothered by conviction. You know, when somebody speaks with conviction, it bothers them fundamentally, and that's their own problem. I think the world needs right now people to speak with conviction and people to make sense and people to not be afraid to say certain things. You know what I mean? So it's, it, you know, I like being that. I like just being myself. Now, at some point, maybe it'll be banned, right? But that's fine. I, I couldn't do this if I had to like hide what I had to do. You know what I mean? Like um, there's this big thing like in IGP now it's like, oh, don't show that. Don't show this. Don't show that because people can't see it because the crazy animal rights activists are campaigning against, you know, dog sport, this and that and everything else. And I always laugh. I say, listen, this is the day I have to hide what I do. I don't want to do it anymore. I will not hide like a criminal in the dark. You know, I will always be honest and open about what I'm doing. Right. So that's my opinion anyways. SoCal in the house. Nice to talk to you, Karen. Biggest challenge is finding good dogs today. The longer I'm in this business, the more the right people I meet. I don't have so many challenges finding good dogs today. They're offered to me all the time. Thank God. Uh, I hate adopt, don't shop. So you only support the unplanned breeding of two random dogs who will not be a stable match. Exactly, Soulstar. There's no comparison. We mean adopt, don't shop. You know, it's like so stupid. It's like saying like, go to the junkyard and, and buy a car because maybe you'll be able to find a good car in the junkyard. It's like, and I get it. They're living creatures and, and we should have, you know, respect and mercy for them. But at the same time, we should never say, let's reward bad behavior. The behavior of, you know, putting dogs together with no rhyme or reason or purpose, you know, whether it's an accident that happened on the street or whether it happened in the back of some crack house or whether some, you know, stupid individual decided to breed his husky to a Malwa, it doesn't particularly matter. These are all the products of bad choices and bad decisions. And if out of the goodness of your heart, you decide to take one of these things into your home and give them your love and your, your, your compassion and your care, surely God will reward you for that. But at the same time, it's let's not pretend that it's like this is the only moral thing to do. No, we still need to maintain, you know, like for, for thousands of years, we have been using dogs as companions, guardians, hunters, you know, uh, for, for sport activity, so on and so forth. You know, if we want to maintain good dogs and good breeding, which I think is a good thing, you know, it's like horses. It's like we don't need horses really anymore. But we should, what are you telling me? We should just like breed them willy nilly? No, of course not. We like purpose bred. I like looking at something that is the product of many, many generations of intention and purpose and care and control, right? Like a master gardener out in his garden. It's like this beautiful garden, every shrub carefully tended, every tree carefully pruned. This is what a well-bred dog is. It's not just my, like, let, let's say I, I make some nice dogs, you know, with, um, with Chico and, uh, you know, with, with another female. And it's like, it's not just my work. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm part of the chain, but you can go back from that pedigree. You can go back over a hundred years and see the careful intention and purpose and the testing and the rigorous, attention to detail and care and concern in that entire pedigree. That is a beautiful thing. Just like a beautiful car, a beautiful home, a beautiful garden. It's, it's just another one of the many beauties that we have available to us in this world. And this idea that we must all like, you know, just, oh, just take this product of, 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 of irresponsible accidents, right? Like, no, that's, that's not appropriate. That's not right. You know, if you want to do it out of the goodness of your heart, all the power to you. But it's become like this uber virtue signaling campaign. It makes no sense. I love bullies. They are the best. I have three. They are big marshmallows. It took training, but all two are service dogs and one is a search and rescue dog. All were hard to train, but so satisfying. Awesome. Happy to hear it. 
Would you breed to bully Drakenwolf? I don't know. I never met the dog, but I don't need to travel far for the dog. I think he's like out west, right? Like, I don't need to travel far for the dog, for dogs to breed. Like, I have really, I have like a, like, I know of four or five fantastic studs that I doubt, you know, and no offense to Bully and, and Dominic. I'm sure he's like a nice dog. I never met him. And I'm, I know Dominic is a good trainer, obviously. Um, but, uh, like I, I very much doubt he's he's of a better quality than than like four dogs I could name that are very local. You know, Russ Fox's dog, my dog Chico, Jack's dog. You know, these are like top level, top top level dogs. You know that that for sure have nice pedigrees and and will will pass. I think Ann Lee has a half brother also to my um my dog Bang. Uh, so out of Nitra as well, I'm sure that dog is going to be fantastic as well. So it's like, there's plenty of good dogs around, man. We don't need to go out West. Um, Anthony Russell. Hey, has, I have a Zoob DDR. You would love low mention to the folks about hype and avoiding all the marketing be us out there. Anthony, do you like that dog out of Zoob? I'm curious. I work in the veterinary field and I have a stock dog bloodline, Australian Shepherds. My coworkers are shocked that they behave and allow vet work. My dogs don't vary away with anything. Good, Lady Gecko Foot. Happy to hear it. Back in the day, I had full brother from a repeat breeding. A brother of Carmen Tinkerhook was the best German Shepherd I ever had. Built like a little tank. Cool. Uh, will reactivity ever fully go away or is it just a system of management? Depends on the dog. Depends how intense the behavior is. Uh, my dog still gets tense and locks in then growls if too close to other dogs. Yeah, well, that's you not going all the way foggy froggy. You have to go all the way, my friend. Like, he shouldn't feel comfortable to do that on a regular basis. Like, if something really egregious happens and he reacts a little bit, that's one thing. But if he's always reacting you know, on a regular basis, it cannot be allowed. And you are allowing it. You know, your dog perceives it's possible. He's drawn his line in the sand. I'll be good up until this point. And you say, no, man, I don't care if the other dog's hair is touching you. You will behave yourself. You will not do this. It's not possible to do this around here. Um, I said Waller Horse is producing nice dogs because um, I've seen several from Waller Horse that are super nice. Um, Pamela says, by the way, can't wait to come up with Bruce. That's a Vasco son for shield training this spring. Can't wait. Awesome. It's your calling. That's why I assume you're talking about being a dog trainer. I, it would appear it is my calling. I don't know. Maybe I have more than one calling. We'll see. Oh, that's awesome, guys. I don't know if you heard it. There's a coyote howling. He's like singing. There's a couple of them singing now. They've been singing a lot recently. They're out in the in the in the conservation area right by my house. Woo, listen to that. I don't think you guys can hear it. It is beautiful. I love it. Oh man, it sounds like they're on something. I take you guys out there, man. I love that sound. Do you guys hear it? Sounds like maybe they got something. Wow. I love that noise. Did you guys hear it? Primal. Let's see what else we got. Would I be willing to criticize your logo, Maddie? I'm not sure how to make it. Um, sure, you could post in the group. Learned about the mythical forum dogs. Has learned about the mythical forum dogs that earned IGP threes with no training. <laughs> Gregory, do you, Gregory, were you on the German Shepherd Forum? Man, I remember those days, the German Shepherd Forum. There was so many shit talkers and bullshitters on that forum. The second everybody went to Facebook and you actually had to like show you know, your dogs, they all disappeared. Did you notice that? I actually met one or two of them mad, like shit dogs, but they were talking so, so highly, like everybody was respecting them and stuff. Like now in this day where you have to show, it's a different time, you know? 
Devin Floyd, thanks for all the courses. I look forward to the certification course as well. Devin, thanks for 20 bucks, buddy. I'll smoke one of these from you. The worst dogs are the best trainers. You're right, Keto. Very much so. I tried force-free positive only training and the quality of behavior of the dogs was so far below what I trained with corrections and punishment. I need one of the soft sticks. You must have balance, you know, like good things and bad things. It's life, right? Like nothing in life is good without balance. I don't know why we still need to learn this lesson, you know. Denise, did you get a little spicy because I said to... Um, uh, Good thing you have two sons because two daughters can't be in business, I guess. Denise, I have two daughters, but uh, I don't think they're going to be entrepreneurs. I hope that they raise a beautiful family and that I get to see my grandchildren from them one day. Um, you know, but if you've got two daughters that are oriented to be entrepreneurs, let's face Why are we playing this game? Oh, oh, the, the girl, the, this is nonsense. The majority of entrepreneurs are men and the majority, like you never hear like, like two sisters in business together. You hear always brothers in business together. And it's not a bad thing. We're just wired differently. We do different things. Now is, I'm sure there are two sisters in business together somewhere. Like, of course there are, but we speak in generalities. Just like, you know, like I'm sure, you know, there's somebody out there with an awfully trained cat. Do I recommend you start doing it? Like, no, it's, it's, like, I, I don't know why we have to always play these games, you know? It's like, uh, everybody has to get a fucking lollipop. Any news on Victor? There isn't... Yeah, he's training, man. He's training. How's Michael P sparring? Is from Ryan. I don't know. You you know Michael. Michael's getting better, man. Like, listen, Michael's like, what is he? He's like 18? Fuck, he's a young kid, man. Michael's young. I'm old, right? So Michael, in if he keeps it going, like for sure, at some point, he'll be beating me up. <laughs> that's that's I wish I was doing what Michael's doing now at his age. That was not my path, obviously. That's not what you know God wanted me to do. But like, and I'm fine with it, but like. I'm a little jealous. Like, Michael's in a good place. You know, he's training dogs. He's he's learning, you know, boxing. Like, he's in a good place. This is what young guys should be doing, you know, out there working hard, building themselves mentally, physically, and young ladies too, right? Building themselves mentally, physically, developing themselves, you know, and then when they're my age, they can really reap the benefits of that. I'm a little bit behind if you really want to think about it. At what age do German shepherds start showing suspicion towards strangers? Uh, it can be right away. It can be 18 months, two years. You know, at some point, if you have a dog, even if it's generally socially outgoing and confident, something will trip that. So you'll see something trip that, you know. Why don't I like keeping many females? Just, I don't like having, like, so many females in the kennel, you know. Like, I, it's easy to look after a few of them when you start having many of them. Then I have to hire more people to look after them because I don't just leave them in the kennel. Like they come out and they train every day. Like I don't believe in dogs just rotting in the kennel. Like you can't do that, right? They have to come out. They have to be trained every day. They have to be mentally and physically stimulated. They have to be loved. They have to be fed. They have to be groomed. They have to have all the things that a dog needs to have. And this requires labor. Uh, let's see here what else we have. Has has the best YouTube videos. 100% hands up. Appreciate you. How many times does that train go by a day? About four times. Any advice for a German Shepherd that gets car motion sick? Yeah, put him in a small crate. That will often help. Jumping back to Onyx, a lot of his puppies would uh, also... Um, get car sick for like the first few rides, right? And then after a few long rides, they would not be car sick anymore. But that was interesting. Like I saw that a lot with his puppies, you know? So funny little uh, genetic thing he seemed to pass. But they did get over it as long as you kept putting them in the car and taking them for drives. What is a good way to start bonding with your dog? Just live with them. Take them for walks. Has make your own e-collar brand. Man, that's like technical stuff. It's technical stuff. Cheryl, I recently lost a dog to DM. I'm sorry, Cheryl. It always sucks when the back end stops working. 
it's it's not a good thing and we should definitely avoid it in breeding you know never carrier to carrier never never you know that's that's fundamentally it working on my dog freya she's very high prey how do i work this i have chickens and ducks and geese she has obedience but her prey drive won't allow me to take her off lead well if your dog wants to go after the small animals that you have then you must correct her for this you must set her up for it in a way that obviously the animals don't get hurt and then you must correct her severely for this and you must break this habit you must correct her for it while you're there and then once she's good while you're there then you must set it up in such a way that you're not there or she thinks you're not there and then you correct her again if she tries to go to them you know and that's fundamentally it there's no magic there uh dogs from long coat to stock coat don't qualify for worlds so hurricane would have to be bred to another long coat oh i thought it was i thought it was any long coat greg not that i care you know i'm for me like she doesn't have like the extreme behavior i would look for like in a world level dog um not not many dogs do but like the dog swamp i have for instance she has a really nice prey drive you know she's a dog that'll produce like like more sport sport dogs you know and the male i'm breeding her to like for sure will will probably make some 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 crazy crazy ones there but like swamp uh she, the the long coat to uh chico i think i mean look you never know because like her pedigree has some nice dogs in it too so it's like you never know what's gonna pop up but uh i know it'll give me the kind of dogs that my clients need right there are some dog breedings you do for yourself and there's some breedings you do for your clients because what i like is not what most people like too that's the other thing right i'll always look for extremes because i'm a hobbyist i'm a connoisseur right most people are not so you must also understand this when you breed dogs so i don't i don't breed dogs for like the average person like i'm still breeding chico to her so like i know the puppies are going to be drivey and intense and so on and so forth but like Will they be extreme puppies? Maybe, but I wouldn't say they're probably going to be more like nice puppies. I don't think they're going to be extreme, extreme. Let's see here. When you're working with a medium high prey drive, outwardly focused dog what are your key takeaways for gaining 100 percent handler attention under distraction well i prevent access to the dog self-satisfying in the environment and i put pressure on the dog so like for instance juice like when she sees something that stimulates the prey drive she tries to start barking and lunging towards it if i just held on to her and let her do that i'm allowing her to self-satisfy instead i begin to put pressure on her until she stops that behavior and then i say okay let's do something now that i have your attention right Instead of, yeah, I'll just stand here and hope you at some point turn around and decide to engage with me. Like, or here's a cookie, please look at me. I don't do that, right? It's like, no, you must not do that. So, okay, there's a ball on the ground. She learns she can go crazy to get after the ball or whatever she sees, right? And now she's like, okay, well, it's not possible to engage in this behavior anymore because this behavior, not only does this behavior not accomplish drive satisfaction for me and you have to people don't understand just because she didn't get the ball doesn't mean she didn't get drive satisfaction if she even got to bark at the ball and chase the ball a little bit and pull me a little bit towards the ball she still got drive satisfaction maybe not all the way as far as she wanted but she still got it so what you have to do is you have to make that behavior not only unproductive but unpleasant for the dog right and then you have to say you are only allowed to express this behavior when i tell you on what i tell you right that's fundamentally it I don't answer how much questions in a uh, live chat. You, if you're serious about, he's not cheap. I'll promise you that. If you're serious about the dog, you can email us. Uh, no, Brent, the weather is excellent today. Um, I hate when people idolize wolves and compare them to dogs in the working city. One is a wild animal. One coexists with you and has a job. Yeah, they're very different. They're very different. They don't have. You know, wolves have a strong sense of self-preservation, which makes them not particularly good pets or working dogs. People don't understand this, you know. But if you think about it, like, if they didn't have a very strong sense of self-preservation, which basically makes them, you know, 
opportunistic and also like what we would call generally very nervy, um, they wouldn't survive very long in the wild because an injury in the wild for a wolf is the end of life, right? What are my thoughts on the dog daddy versus Zach George situation? Well, Zach George is a human tampon. I've been say I said it before and I'll say it again. Um, he just he's so misleading. He's just such a slimy, you know, waste of. Anyways, point being, I have no problem talking badly about Zach George because I think that he legitimately is 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 misleading a lot of people. And he's genuinely negatively affecting a lot of dogs and, you know, not helping at all in the training perspective. But he touts himself as some kind of expert, which he clearly is not. Um, I don't know, Dog Daddy. I mean, I've seen some of his videos. Like, you know, he definitely has some ability. There's no question about it. Um, you know, some of those dogs he's handling are... are you know, I've said this before, I'll say it again real quick. Some of those dogs he's handling are legitimate. Like, they're legitimate dogs in terms of, like, having behavioral problems. He seems to be able to, you know, build a rapport with them relatively quickly and be able to work with them. That's good. Um, I don't think what he does translates very well to the owners, which is kind of his job. So, yeah, I can take the crazy dog and get him to stop being crazy. But the problem is, my job is not to do that. I'm not going to keep the dog. I'm going to give him back to you. So, you need to be able to do that. And what he does might work for him, but it's not going to work for 99.9% .9 of the people that are bringing their dogs to him. So, but I think he's like, you know, Gucci and everything. <laughs> he's still way more, you know, uh, legitimate than Zach George. So, you know, I think Zach George is very, um, threatened by dog daddy because I think dog daddy is the first, like since Caesar Milan and Caesar Milan kind of missed social media, right? Like if Caesar Milan came along, maybe, I don't know, 10, 20 years later, he would be in the same position as, kind of dog daddy where like he's really threatening you know zach george's monopoly i think he's, he's like the biggest guy on youtube right the algorithm loves him the pet dog the pet food brands love him and all that stuff so they all sponsor him and push his stuff right but um he's a terrible dog trainer unfortunately i think he's kind of like the last popular like tv but he's a social media dog trainer that's like that can't train dogs, you know, like we had the Victoria Stillwells, we had like, we had a few others of these guys, you know, like they were like, or, or girls, they, they were just like, bullshit, you know, like they couldn't train dog to save their life, but somehow they ended up on TV, you know, and there was like a whole show about them. And he's kind of like that, but on social media. And now it's like, you know, in this age of social media, you can see for yourself what works and what doesn't work. So that's why you see, you know, Zach George, now he's like desperate, like he's trying to like get all his followers to show up and protest and blackmailing anyone that hosts Dog Daddy and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's funny to watch because I like watching, you know, slimy people, you know, generally I think with, with like slimy people, like it always comes home to roost, you know, the truth always comes out and, um, you know, his uh, hegemony of, of the uh, algorithm is being threatened by a guy like Dog Daddy. So that's fundamentally what's happening. What's the what's so bad about canine sport? What's the reason behind banning it? Because what people don't understand is animal rights activists don't stop at banning training tools. They then ban certain breeds. They then ban, once they ban training tools, they then ban certain sports. It's a progressive thing, right? Terrorists never stop with one demand. That's why you don't negotiate with terrorists, right? We know this already because it's like you give them their initial demands. They then demand more and more and more and more. So there's nothing wrong with dog sport. There's nothing wrong with dog racing. There's nothing wrong with any of this stuff, right? But the crazy animal rights activists have a very uh, incremental approach and they're going to keep going until somebody finally just says no to them or if no one says no to them eventually you're not going to be able to own a dog unless you have like a special license and you've gone before like a board of like a cabal of like these force-free you know 
trainers or whatever, like they're this like SPCA or whatever, you have to go stand before them and beg for permission to have a dog. And then they'll give you like one of their scraggly mutts from the back, you know, if you're lucky, that's where it's going, you know, and you have to like in submit like home visits, they'll come visit your home and make sure, you know, like you're allowed to keep this dog and, you know, you'll have to probably pay them for, for their useless training and go through that. And <laughs> I can just see it all now, you know, Oh, uh, unfortunately, uh, you have not earned enough carbon credits today um, to get your dog. Uh, we we heard you said some very unpleasant things online about climate change. So you lost a few carbon credits. Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to um, get one of our dogs today. But, you know, if you attend your re-education training, um, you know, maybe in, in a year you can come back and we'll give you a mutt. That's where it's going. All right. The perfect fighter in the video about the police officer that punished a dog on camera for biting him. In that video, you said that double pur dual purpose canines will not be a thing for much longer. Could you elaborate on that? No, it's quite frankly, there's two reasons why dual purpose canines will not be a thing for much longer. The PR is not good, right? Even though the, the, the dogs actually do like a really good job. And I think they're actually very invaluable members of like the team. I think they save a lot of uh, suspects lives. I think they save a lot of officers lives. I think they're generally, you know, a net benefit. Um, the fundamental reality now is policing. It's not a good time to be a cop. And uh, it's an even worse time, I think, to be a police canine handler and a police dog. Um, you know, if the dog bites the wrong person, and by the wrong person, I mean the wrong person. Not necessarily not a bad guy, but the wrong person, right? You're going to be in a whole heap of shit. Um, you know, if the dog bites too many people, oh, why is this dog getting so many apprehensions? What's wrong with him, you know? Uh, oh, is the handler racist? So on and so forth. Like, these are the, the questions that are are being asked now. And I'm not kidding. I'm not, like, being facetious on, on here. Like, you know... The reality is any kind of force that the police utilize is very scrutinized now. And it's very, people are very suspicious of it. And it's not that I'm saying that, you know, the police don't make mistakes or that there's not some bad cops out there that do bad things. But to be quite honest, I'm, I'm much more prefer a society that has a strong law and order and, and a good rule of law versus a society that does not. I'm also a big fan of police departments that, are directly accountable to the people that they work for. So like sheriff's departments and stuff, I mean, they got to get voted in, right? They're directly accountable to the constituents. Much better than like these kind of giant police forces that are only accountable to like some bureaucrat, you know. But anyways, that's a that's a, that's a a side note. So yeah, the, the police dogs, it, it's just very unpopular, um, you know, with all the stuff going on against law enforcement now. It's one more tool that's going to be removed from them. Which, ironically, is probably going to end up hurting more people and more cops, but that doesn't really matter in the law, in the grand scheme of things. It's all about optics, right? Then the other thing is you have to look about look at drone technology. Drone technology is so far advanced beyond what we even know. Like, look at the kind of drone you can buy in the store, right? Now, imagine like 10x that with AI. Okay, so we've got AI, we've got drones. You've got drones that can move on the ground. You've got drones that have... You, you, can, you can arm drones with lethal and less lethal. Uh, you've got drones that can see infrared. You've got drones that can... So let me put it to you this way, okay? You got a suspect vehicle taking off. You deploy your drones. You're, you got four drones that go up in the sky and immediately set up a grid and start searching for the individual. Then you've got the drone that goes out on the ground, deployed maybe from the cruiser or whatever, and starts searching on the ground. All these drones are talking to each other. All these drones are being coordinated by AI and directly interfacing with the officers. The officers probably don't even leave their car anymore. They locate the suspect. They bracket him with their air assets and with their ground assets. They order him to surrender with the speakers of the drone. If he doesn't they utilize the less lethal or i'm sure they also have access to lethal on those drones as well um and it's done and that's probably less than 10 years folks you know we've already got drones that can go in and clear houses uh, we got drones that can move across any terrain drones that can go into water land air everything so you know fundamentally the more cheap and available the technology becomes the more intelligent and long-lasting the technology is the less you have need for blood and you know sweat and uh you know biological 
biologicals like dogs and humans. So fundamentally, that's why uh, dual purpose. And, and hey, drones aren't racist. Can't say a drone's racist, right? So, you know, can't say a drone's, you know, uh, police brutality or whatever. It's a drone, right? It's, it's just this computer. It's, it's, a, it's controlled by AI, right? So this is, this is where it's going. I don't think it's a good thing. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I'm, I, I think it's a really bad thing. But fundamentally, that is where it's going. Right. So the police dogs, you're going to see less police, police officers, you're going to see less police dogs. Um, technology is really advancing and people, I don't think, really realize how much it's advancing and how fast it's advancing. What breeds do I consider sleeper breeds for protection? I don't really consider them. Um, I mean, look, what, what do you want? You want a dog you can like lock in your yard and he's going to be a deterrent? Okay, like get yourself a Kangal, get yourself a Preza, get yourself a Mastiff of any kind, you know. You want to do bite work? Well, that's a different thing, you know. So it's like I always say to people, what do you really want, you know. You want a nice, well-trained dog that you can do bite work and all this type of stuff? Well, then you want a German Shepherd or a Belgian Malinois or something like this. You want a, just a dog that's like you know, going to hang out in the house and be a, a deterrent and maybe chew somebody up if the wrong person comes in the yard. Well, then you get, you know, like more of a guardian breed, right? That's, that's fundamentally it. People are always kind of trying to get everything. And it's like, not every dog can do every job. A correction is too harsh. A correction is too harsh when A, the dog doesn't understand it and B, it creates an unproductive response in the dog, right? So like, you know, like utilize common sense here. You tell your dog to sit, he doesn't sit, and you beat him with a two by four. He's probably not going to understand that he's getting beaten by the two by four for not sitting. And, um, you know, that's probably, uh, well, it's not probably, it's definitely, you know, way more egregious of a correction than is required for the act of not sitting, right? I like that you talk straight with people. I once asked a question on another live chat. You were straight up on it, and it helped a lot. Stay real, has. I appreciate you, Renee. I'm glad I helped you. Do you believe that teaching a dog only to bark in someone's face, no bite work, increases the risk of bites and aggression? I have a friend who thinks it would cause issues. Depends how it was taught. Um, but this idea, like, oh, I'll just go halfway in protection, you know, like, I'll just make my dog bark, but he'll never bite. Uh, I don't think it's a very realistic one. What else have we got here? Have I ever heard of the Canis Panther breed? Yeah. It's just another hype train. You know what I mean? Like, oh, Canis Panther or Chinese Red Dogs, just all hype trains, right? Take my money. I pay up front and preemptively keep my dogs out of the shelters. Exactly, Leslie. You know, it's like you don't really see quality purebred dogs in shelters. And if you do, it's rare. And when they are there, they get snapped up fast. You know what I mean? It's like there's nothing wrong with, with producing desirable animals. You know, I, like I have a Andalusian stallion. If something were to happen to me and he was to ever end up without a home, that dog, that, that horse would be snapped up so fast. All my dogs, highly desirable dogs, super bloodlines, super training, high quality animals. Something happens to me, those dogs are all spoken for quickly. You know what I mean? Desirable, worth something, has value more than just like, oh, it's a personal value, you know, like an intrinsic value, right? So it's like, there's nothing wrong with that. That should be applauded that, that people are producing animals like this. It's good. It's a good thing. After putting on the e-collar, how long would you generally wait before actually using the device so the dog doesn't become collar-wise? 10, 15 minutes. Have I ever thought about owning or breeding bull herders? Absolutely not. I would never do it. Uh, foggy Froggy. Thanks for your answer. Been able to teach a lot to my dog through the knowledge you provide. Awesome. Happy to hear it, man. Let's see what here. They caught a bunny. Yeah, Erica, they might have caught a bunny. Who knows? Let's see what else we got here.
Can you do a video about the best way to break up a dog fight? There seems to be a lot of nonsense about this. <laughs> um, the best way to break up a dog fight is to wait until somebody is on top and you grab the person on top and you choke him off the other one and preferably somebody else can grab the other one or if he's on top, usually the other one doesn't want it anymore anyway. So once you get the, the one on top off, then, then they will, uh, the other one leaves the situation anyways. Um, that's typically how I do it. I don't jump in between because that's how you get bit. And maybe I've just, you know, been bit a few too many times. I, I don't like getting bit. So I'll wait until one's on top and then I'll choke that one off. And usually that's a day. You can't send a duck to Eagle School. Exactly. How many times do I train my dog a day? Uh, it depends, you know, like Gage, I like now I'm training him like every other day and I'm usually doing like two, two, 10, 15 minute sessions with him, you know, and that's it. Like he's already an IGP three with my younger dog. And I'm still probably like, I have three dogs that I'm running right now. I run them each about two times a day. Okay, Ryan, I'll ask him about your slip leads. Is it okay for a dog's teeth to bleed slightly while you play tug with the ball to build drive? Sure it is. A little discomfort never killed anybody, certainly not a dog. What's my favorite dog training topics to riff on? I like riffing on a lot of dog training topics in case you haven't noticed. Do I own a pet dog at home? I have like a 14-year-old Chihuahua. <laughs> and I have Gage living in the house with me. How do I spell Walla Horse? Waller Horst. I named my Onyx after your Onyx. And she is bad in the car with travel sickness. Messes up my car. Put her in a crate. No, mixed dogs do not tend to be healthier. That is actually not true. You just get a dog that is coming from health-tested, you know, uh, health-tested lines, and you'll be fine. You know, this idea is like all these mixed dogs are so healthy. It's like, no, that's actually not true. <laughs> There's plenty of mixed dogs that I see here in my day-to-day -day training that are certainly not uh, the pictures of good health. I'm noticing more vets recommending gastropexy for GSD, specifically working dogs. I lost my dog once to bloat, but it feels like the next pain neuter campaign. I mean, look, I know a few people. I've lost one of my working German shepherds to bloat. You know, like I had actually just sent him to a police department and like the next day he got bloat and he died. He was like a year old, you know, it was very sad, right? Like, I don't know. Like, I, I have some friends who've lost dogs to blow at, like, five, six years old. It can happen. I don't I don't actually see a problem with gastroplexy. Is that how you say it? Gastroplexy. Gastropexy. I mean, if it ensures the... If there's no side effects and it ensures, like, that the dog will never get bloat, I think it's a good thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> Zach George is missing a Y chromosome. Uh, okay, I'm way behind on these comments, guys. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't say that Zach George is a human tampon. It's nice to give in to your baser instincts when you see somebody who you do not like and do not agree with and do not think is doing good things. But perhaps that's maybe there's nicer ways to say that uh, I don't think he's... There's more... There's more... Uh, I don't know what the word is. There's less crude ways to say that, perhaps. But sometimes I like being crude, which is definitely a flaw of mine. Calling unfit dogs from pedigree, some people come up with weird standard look and ruin and some lines of same breed making some of the undesired recessive traits prominent in the pool gene. Yeah, that's true, Luke. That's very true. 
Uh, let's see what else we've got going on. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, you know, like you're talking about shelter dogs. Like they act like you're adopting a child. I think it's easier to adopt a child than it is to adopt from some rescues, you know? Like they act like they're giving you like their firstborn son, not some dog, you know, that's been passed through like three different homes and nobody wanted it until you finally said, I'll give him a home. Now you have to go through like five home visits and they're going to check your credit. <laughs> I did, like don't get me wrong like obviously you want to make sure he's not going to like a terrible place but like you know they take it way too far it's like relax lady um no you're not gonna get super prestige german shepherds and prestige landon never say that to me again never i'm not even gonna read your comment it's heresy Uh, let's see what else we got here. <laughs> what key takeouts with your breeding program from your podcast with Stefan will you implement? I already like, I already agree with Stefan and all those things, you know, it wasn't like new information. Um, you know, for the most part, I agree with Stefan on everything already, you know, like I've been working with Stefan for like, you know, I've been subscribing to a lot of the things that Stefan says um, and, and believes. And I've talked to Stefan, you know, numerous times before we had that podcast. So like his ideas are not new for me. Dude, always entertaining to talk to him. And he's always like, he's like a font of information, right? I'm not talking about UFOs. I actually have no interest. You know, we have, we've we got enough problems on Earth. We don't need to worry about off Earth. You know? I see all your positive comments, guys. Thank you. <laughs> have I ever heard of Leiju Hong Dog? No. <laughs> No, <laughs> I have two females that fought once. I pulled the more dominant one off the other. The other didn't pursue. I was very lucky. You know, it's funny. A lot of dog fights, you know, like if you wait till one's on top and you take the other off, usually there's not too much damage. Um, I find like if you like try to get between and they come apart and they get back together and come apart and get back together, that's when you really see a lot of damage, you know. We just finished the training course there. Your trainer, Hef, was awesome. And you said you guarantee my dog will be totally different. Complete training. 100% correct. Thank you. Mark, I'm happy your dog is different. I'm happy your dog is listening to you. And Hef is a very, uh, very good guy. A good guy to train with. Started your online course as excellent product. I've started using it. And so far, it's working. Can't wait to do more. Yeah, guys, check out my online courses, shieldk9online.com, and then I have a Patreon. Just search me on Patreon, shieldk9, and uh, you can see all my online products, and they are freaking good. I have no problem to say it. You know, I've, I've, I've done, like, other online courses and stuff, like, you know, over the years, and you know, a lot of them leave a lot of uh, stones unturned. I don't leave stones unturned when I, tr when I uh, show you guys things, whether it's correcting dogs for reactive behavior, teaching obedience, all that stuff. We don't leave the stones unturned. It's very detailed, hours of video, how to do everything, how to fix everything, how to avoid the common problems everybody runs into when they're doing these things. You know how I talk on here? It's like that, but in even more detail with me actually training dogs in front of you. Let's see what else we got. Are you able to keep your emotions away when it's time to deliver a cor correction and send it as information? My emotions are information. What is this idea that like corrections can have to be like this emotionless thing? There's nothing wrong with your dog knowing you're angry with him if he does something, right? Like my dog knows, like if he's reactive around me, I say, hey, don't do that shit. He knows, he hears it in my voice, he sees it in my tone, he sees it in my posture. I am upset with you. That is meaningful information to him. The dogs have been domesticated for thousands of years right? 
like they have they have been domesticated they know they've been working with us for thousands of years they are highly attuned to our body language to our emotions why wouldn't you use them in training I'm not saying get drunk come home and beat your dog i'm saying this idea like when i'm happy with my dog and i'm amped in training i'm amped and happy with my dog that's why he looks like so amped and happy in training right and also when i'm upset with him or another dog for, for, for doing inappropriate behavior around me. They are in no doubt that this behavior is inappropriate. Now, there is a time where correction should be less emotional, but there's like this weird idea perpetuated that your dog should never think you're angry with him and you should just deliver emotionless pressure to your dog. And I don't believe that. And I have not seen that to be the case at all. What else have we got in here? I'm just going to find if there's anything that really catches my mind. Do you think you will do more videos on Carson and his new dog, particularly him building the bond in obedience? That's already way better, you know? Um, well, yeah, we'll probably do another video with him. It's not rocket science. It's the same thing we do, you know, like with all the dogs, right? Like I take all the dogs through all my training courses. Like, so Carson's dog, my dog, Chico, whatever, right? Like we get these dogs in. We teach them, um, you know, all the behaviors we want with a mixture of positive and negative reinforcement. We show them how to deal with the pressure in a productive way. Um, and then we just start scaling our expectations based on where the dog is at in training. And that builds the bond. <laughs> That's it. You know, consistency. It turns out that building a bond with a dog requires nothing more than the consistent application of positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement and punishment for the occasional, you know, unacceptable behavior and then just doing stuff with your dog. That's all you need to do, right? Like if you're able to control your dog, if your dog respects the consequences and the boundaries and the, the rules that you have, that builds the bond. And it's not, it doesn't take actually a long time, you know, like, like when people see Chico now, like when they see me training with Chico or they see Carson with his dog, they're like, holy shit, it's like a different dog than the one we saw like on the week one. It's like, yeah. Because dogs flourish in this system. They are like, you know, like, it's like watering a flower in the desert, you know? Positive reinforcement, you know? Negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment, uh, cooperative play, tasks together. Oh, fuck, he loves me. It's magic, right? Like, it's, it's not complicated. How do I avoid capping a dog's drive when healing from an activation? I'm not sure, creatine, what you're saying there. Creatine, you're asking real specific questions that, like, would depend on a lot of variables. A lot of these questions I answer in my courses, by the way. All right, guys. I think we're going to call it a day. We've been... We've been going, man. We've been going. We've been going. It's been good. It's been good. I enjoyed this conversation. My cigar was shit today. I don't know what's going on. Maybe I got a little too humid in there. I got to check my humidor. Um, but anyways, guys, thank you very much for watching. And it was always good to hang out with you guys. See you on the next one.